Hello everyone, Helen here. Thanks for stopping by to join me today. Hope you're doing all right. You can see today I'm in the camper van, which can only mean one thing. We're going to go off on a trip and uh, I hope you're going to enjoy coming along with us. And if you're a new viewer, uh, then uh, yeah, my husband Phil and I bought this camper van just a few months ago. So it's still still pretty new to us. We're still getting used to everything and uh, but I hope you're going to enjoy uh, coming along. So we went off for a couple of nights uh, to the county of Northumberland, which lies just north of County Durham, where we live. You can see here where it is in relation to the rest of the UK. And here you can see how the northern border of Northumberland meets with the Scottish borders and to the west is Cumbria. So as well as doing some nice things to celebrate my birthday weekend, uh, we wanted to see what it would be like staying in the van during the colder weather. It was certainly quite cold. The temperature during our trip ranged from minus two to two centigrade, which is about 28 to 35 Fahrenheit. There wasn't any significant snow anywhere, though, and we didn't encounter any particularly icy roads. Um, but we did enjoy travelling through the beautiful, wintry, frosty landscape. Now, the start of our journey was literally rather a bumpy one uh, because for the first time that I can remember, our trust in the sat-nav was somewhat let down. <laughs> we were OK to begin with at the idea of going through a gated road because uh, the sign on the gates only requested that we close them after us and giving no indication that there was any problem ahead. Uh, but uh, very soon we found that there was no road at all and instead we were in rather a lumpy field. Uh, we did manage to negotiate our way back to a normal road without damaging the van and we had stern words with Dave, our sat-nav guide. <laughs> well, we continued on our way through some lovely white-dusted countryside. Heading in the first place for Kielder Forest and Reservoir up in the northwestern corner of Northumberland. And we stopped in a little place called Bellingham for lunch where we came across a tea room called Tea on the Train, which consisted of a couple of old 1960s train carriages. It's where the former railway station was, although there hasn't been a railway service through this small market town for many years. The railway was opened in 1861 and it was in use for just over a hundred years. In September 1939, with the onset of World War II, it saw the arrival of many children who were evacuated from Tynemouth over on the Northumberland coast, and that included my mum. Well, she was only very little then, and she came with her mum. Uh, we were the only customers in the tea room, and we were well looked after by the two friendly ladies there. And we really enjoyed our toasted turkey, brie and cranberry paninis with our cups of tea. We set off again and we soon caught our first glimpse of Kielder Water, situated in the Kielder Valley and surrounded by forest. Plans for a reservoir were approved in 1974 and I can still remember the controversy about whether it was the right thing to do. But it went ahead and in 1982 it was officially opened by Queen Elizabeth II. While it was still light, we looked around for a possible overnight spot 
we'd been hoping to stay in one of the Northumbrian water car parks, which normally allows overnight parking. But they all had signs saying that overnighting was temporarily suspended. However, we parked for a short while with just an hour or so of daylight left and we decided to go for a walk along by the reservoir. The light was fading when we set off again and we drove the short distance to see Kielder Dam. To create the reservoir, the Kielder Valley had to be flooded, which meant the loss of many homes and farms, a school and a railway line. You can feel the sense of loss if you read this children's storybook called The Dam, written by David Armand, which is a true story told to the author by local, uh, well-known folk musician Catherine Tickell. Just before the valley was flooded, Catherine's father, who's also a fine folk musician, took her around the abandoned houses and they played fiddle and sang in each building, a kind of plaintive farewell to all the lives that had been played out there. Anyway, the dam was completed in 1981 and the valley duly flooded. And over the years, many people have come here and enjoyed the beautiful surroundings and also come here at night to enjoy some of the darkest skies in England. A little later, we drove off and found a lovely cosy pub, the Pheasant Inn, and we enjoyed good food and a lovely warm fire. <laughs> we were welcomed with friendliness and I can highly recommend the place if you're ever in the area. We left the pub and after a little drive, chose our overnight spot on a hill just above a little village called Elsden. I filled my hot water bottle and we were soon nice and cosy in our sleeping bags. Well, we remained warm all night and loved waking up to the snowy surroundings. The hills all around were dusted with snow and we had great views in all directions. I was quite excited when I realised that we'd been overnighting next to a place called Winter's Gibbet. Uh, named not after the season of winter, but after a man called William Winter, who had been involved in the m murder of a local woman in 1791. He and a couple of female accomplices had robbed and murdered Margaret Crozier, who'd owned a small draper's shop. The three murderers were caught and tried, and William was hung on the specially built gibbet, not far from where the murder had been committed. His body was left there until everything had rotted, including his clothes, and many sightseers came uh, to see the rogue hanging there. The original gibbet has been replaced several times, but it still feels rather chilling in more ways than one to stand beneath it. 
After a warming bacon butty for breakfast, we headed on our way, this time towards Rothbury, a small market town that lies on the river Colquitt. In the 13th century, it was a centre for dealing in cattle and wool, and it developed further in Victorian times due to the coming of the railway, and also to a local industrialist called Sir William Armstrong, who I'll mention again shortly. We had such a lovely time going around the small independent shops in Rothbury, doing a bit of Christmas shopping or simply enjoying the window displays. There was a brilliant hardware store that's been there since 1898. We couldn't resist going inside to see what treasures it held. <laughs> and there was a wonderful deli called Tully's, packed with all sorts of locally sourced foods, all sorts of things, including an excellent selection of cheeses. We weren't disappointed with the ones that we bought to eat over Christmas time. And there was lots of tempting chocolate and other sweet treats as well. The window display at the deli was a beautiful model of an old shop filled with miniature goodies. And it even had a roaring fire. Another window display that caught my attention was this one where a miniature railway had been built inside an old suitcase. I stood for quite a while, watching transfixed as the little train went round and round the track. We visited a well-stocked sweet shop and admired a merry-go-round in another shop window. And of course, it would have been rude not to go into the beautiful little yarn shop, Rainbow Yarns. It was very well stocked with mostly woolen rather than acrylic yarns. And although it was quite a small space, everything was really well organised and clearly visible. And there was a very friendly lady there as well. Obviously, there were a few other things um, in the shop, uh, which included some felt sewing kits and a good selection of knitting, crochet and sewing books, a few of which I recognised. And although I tried to be fairly restrained, I didn't come out of the shop empty handed. I did have the excuse of it being my birthday the following day. Well, we finished our wanderings and drove a short distance out of Rothbury to visit a historic house called Cragside, which was once owned by the Armstrong family and it's now in the care of the National Trust. The house and estate at Cragside were created uh, starting in about 1863 by Lord William and Lady Margaret Armstrong. William was a designer and manufacturer of hydraulic cranes and ships and armaments and interestingly it was he who built the hydraulic mechanism that operates Tower Bridge in London. The house at Cragside is famous for being the first house in the world to use electricity to light up the rooms using hydroelectricity. The house today is still powered by hydroelectricity via an Archimedes screw that was installed in 2014. The house itself was designed by architect Norman Shaw in the Old English style and as well as electric lights it also had central heating, a hydraulic lift and a water-powered spit in the kitchen. However, we were there mainly to visit the ground floor of the house which had been dressed up for Christmas. After lunch in the cafe, I had a delicious bread roll filled with turkey, stuffing, cranberry sauce and gravy, and we walked up to the house. I was definitely not disappointed. The decorations were absolutely beautiful, mostly using decoration ideas that would have been used in Victorian times, such as the flower arrangements using dried hydrangea flowers. I was delighted that their theme of Twas the Night Before Christmas meant they'd hidden lots of felt mice around the different rooms, which added to my childlike glee. <laughs> um, it was definitely not an activity just to keep the children happy. It kept me happy too.
while we returned to Rothbury for our evening meal uh, and to an excellent place called Buick's, another place that we would highly recommend. We then drove through the darkness to find a spot to park in for the night. We woke up on my birthday morning to a heavy frost and an absolutely gorgeous sunrise. We'd hoped to take advantage of a Forestry Commission car park in nearby Simonside, uh, but as we'd found at Kielder, there were signs up saying that overnight parking was temporarily suspended, so we ended up in a little lay-by on a quiet side road, which really wasn't a problem. We cleared away the condensation and we had breakfast and a bit of relaxation time. I did a bit of crochet, working on the tiny squares to make a blanket for Pearl. And we then drove to our main destination of the day, which was another historic house owned by the National Trust, Wallington Hall. In fact, this was the first acquisition to be gifted to the National Trust back in 1942. A former house on the site was substantially rebuilt in 1688 and it passed from the Blackett family to the Trevelyans in 1777. The house is set in 1300 acres of parkland and it was landscaped by the famous designer Capability Brown. After we warmed up with tea and shortbread in the cafe we walked through some of the woodland to the walled garden. Along the way we came across a fallen tree which apparently had been a victim of Storm Arwen and it's been beautifully carved with lots of different faces and some lovely snowflakes at the end. I also loved the giant willow snowdrops that we came across and a carved owl and the owl was a symbol of the Trevelyan family. As with Cragside on the previous day, Wallington had been finely dressed for Christmas and there were more mice to find as well. <laughs> the rooms were set up to show Christmas in different eras, in Georgian times and Victorian times and in the 1920s to 40s. There were lots of information boards to read as well as lavish decorations to appreciate. I was especially interested to read some of the diary entries by Lady Trevelyan in the first part of the Second World War, uh, such as on the 13th of December 1939, she had attended a concert given by a couple of local schools and wrote, it was a delightful evening but inordinately long. <laughs> and on the 18th of December 1941, she was helping to decorate the village hall with the local WI. And on the 20th, 
7th of December, there was a party given at Wallington Hall for the local school children. And I, I love the ambience given to this Georgian room by the addition of a projection of dancers onto the wall. And in the Great Hall, by the huge Christmas tree where families of the past would have got together and opened their gifts and just had a lot of fun, uh, we were treated to some Christmas piano music. It was all just wonderfully festive and definitely put us in quite a Christmassy mood. We returned to the van and finished off my birthday celebration with a cake and candles, which were taken with us and... I felt really contented and very fortunate to have had such a wonderful birthday. I've always been very happy to have my birthday a week before Christmas. So I hope you enjoyed coming with us today. I've got a little bit more to share with you from the trip and I'm going to save that for another time. So I'll just wish you a lovely week ahead. Take care of yourself and I'll be back again soon. OK, bye.